and I am not going to take it. And I have to use the resources that I have, the wherewithal that I have, the ability that I have, the knowledge that I have to make this right. I am not walking away from it. Maybe I'm being a coward by doing what I'm doing. Because without a doubt, I'm doing what you have done. I'm, I'm lying. I'm conspiring. I'm keeping things secret. And it's going to happen. Well, I'm going to take you on by myself. It's the only way I know how to do it. I'll be dead when it's over, but that's my conviction. I hope that the people of Granby learn that the, the way you punished me over the years that I was down there and how you punished me for the most part turned me into a desperate man. And desperate men do desperate things to recover a lot of times. Marvin John Hemeyer was born on October 28, 1951 in South Dakota. Our story, however, doesn't start until he is 42 years old. At that point in his life, he had no family, no kids, some people knew him, but no one really kept up with him. And one day, he decided to move to Grand Lake, Colorado. People would describe Hemeyer as a likable person and that he would bend over backwards for anyone. He was also described as someone who you wouldn't want to cross, so take that as you will. In 1952, he bought a patch of land in Granby, Colorado, and soon ended up building an automobile muffler shop on said land. To the townspeople, he was just some guy that randomly showed up one day, but he did really good work and some would consider him the best in town. Trouble would soon start to rise when Cody Doshef also wanted land to build his concrete factory on. This led to Marvin and Cody negotiating over Marvin's piece of land. They settled on a deal and Marvin was going to sell his property for $250,000. That is, until Marvin changed the price to $375,000. They agreed again to the new deal and Marvin changed the price again to $1 million a price that Cody wouldn't agree to. In 2001, the Zoning Commission and the city approved the construction of Cody's concrete factory and it was going to be built next to Marvin's shop on the land next to his. That way, they wouldn't have to deal with Marvin anymore and could finally get this factory built. Once construction started though, another huge problem arose. The problem with this factory being built is that there is only one route that Hemeyer can take to get to his shop. But once the construction of this factory started, the only route to his shop was blocked and therefore he couldn't go to work. Of course, Marvin was angry because they approved this plan without his consent or knowledge, and he tried appealing the commission and petitioning against the commission in order to stop the construction of the factory, but it was to no avail. Marvin then shifted his plans and petitioned the construction of a new access road so he can get to his job. He even bought the materials and machines to do so, one of those machines being a Komatsu D355A bulldozer. And he was willing to do the job himself, but this plan was denied as well. The final straw for Hemeyer was when the construction of the factory cut his connection to the sewage line and the council in his city fined him for not being connected. It is important to note that Marvin wasn't connected to the sewage line even before this incident because it would cost too much for him. But even if he wanted to be now, the construction of the factory cut off his connection from all city utilities, and he would have to ask Cody to run a pipe through their land, something which he would have probably declined. With nothing to lose and a grudge towards a ton of people, Marvin came up with a plan. He sold his property for $400,000 and was now given a few months to leave. Instead of leaving, however, he stayed in his shop and started to work on his new project. He took the bulldozer that he owned and made it into an unstoppable tank.
This is a tape of this is when we first arrived on scene, and it looked like uh, officers standing on a hill above this uh, earth mover turned tank were firing some pretty heavy arms at him, trying to find a weak spot, trying to find some way to uh, immobilize. This man was now on the east side of Granby in what's called an independent propane company yard. A bulldozer, hardly. This thing looked more like a tank. Something is taking place in Granby. He was kept on backing in and out of different companies, houses, you name it, he was hitting them. Wes Tinoff had the misfortune of getting caught right in front of it. It was one of the most high-tech things I've ever seen. I wasn't expecting to see pretty much a tank driving down the streets of Granby. He started on the end of town, we are told unofficially, we want to emphasize that, this man owned a business next to the concrete company, that he had a long-standing beef with the concrete company in Granby, a very long-standing, decades old, it was described to us, and then he went after the concrete company first. Town manager Tom Hale says the suspect, Marvin Hemeyer, was upset about the placement of a concrete batch plant next to his business. Uh, he was upset that a uh, batch plant was built next to his uh, muffler shop. But no one expected this. It was something like you'd see on TV, you know, it's hard to believe. Right there, may have taken out a radiator. He doesn't stop for light poles. He doesn't stop for buildings. He takes out the corner of the copycat store. Again, this is right in downtown Granby. But, as they said last night, and they'll say again this morning, the number of the places that he hit, they all appear to be connected to this dispute that Hemeyer had with the town of Granby. This is a dispute that dates back three years ago. He actually sold his muffler shop about seven months ago. So this is a dispute that has been going on for some time, and a lot of people knew about it. But no one expected something like this to happen yesterday. Okay, let's go back a little. So Marvin starts working on his project sometime in 2003, which involved him modifying his bulldozer. He placed makeshift armor plating that covered the engine, cabin, and tracks of the vehicle. The armor was over one foot long and was made using a concrete mix that sat between sheets of tool steel. Cameras were installed out of the tank and were hooked up to two monitors that were inside the machine, allowing Marvin the ability to see what he was doing. These cameras were also covered by 3-inch bulletproof plastic. Three gun ports were installed into the machine so he could protect himself if needed, and there were cooling fans inside the machine so he can keep cool. Because of how insane of a build this was, Marvin couldn't just go in and out like if it was a car. Once the armor was placed on top of the bulldozer with him inside, he was going to stay in there, so he also packed himself a handgun. The final product of a year and a half of work was more or less a tank that was bulletproof and resistant to explosives. Some people visited the shed that Marvin was working in during his year and a half of production, but no one caught on to what he was doing. Purchased to um, build his muffler shop, and he talked with me about doing this uh, back in January, in, just in a conversation while we were having dinner. And, of course, I thought that he was just kidding. I had no idea that he would follow through with it and, can, and continue Bonnie, what they had done to him. Take us again through his gripe. I don't quite understand what he was upset about. Well, you know, I wasn't really paying attention because I thought that he was just kidding. On June 4, 2004, Hemeyer got inside his machine, ready to get his revenge. He drove his armored bulldozer through his old business, destroying it. He then ran through the construction of the concrete factory that started all of his problems. The office of the local newspaper that editorialized against him, the home of a former mayor, a library, a hardware store that was owned by another man that Marvin had a grudge with, and many other buildings. The one thing all of these buildings had in common was that they had wronged Marvin in some way, so their destruction was justified in his head. During this rampage, Many bullets flew at Marvin, but the bulldozer shielded him from everything. Explosives also didn't work. A flashbang grenade was dropped down the bulldozer exhaust pipe, and that also did nothing. It got so bad that the town even suggested using an Apache attack helicopter to fire missiles and destroy the tank. Of course, they didn't go through with it because that would be too dangerous. Marvin ended up destroying 13 buildings and causing $7 million worth of property damage. He was literally unstoppable in his bulldozer, but all good runs do end. When he got to the hardware store, 
the machine Haymeyer built was finally reaching the end of his rampage. The radiator was damaged, the engine started to leak, and then he ended up getting stuck near the tail end of the store. With nowhere left to go, Haymeyer took the handgun he packed and shot himself in the head, ending his life. The police tried using explosives to get into the tank, but that failed, so they had to use a cutting torch to break inside. They found Haymeyer's dead body at 2 o'clock a.m. on June 5, 2004. Even though no one was killed during the incident other than Marvin, the machine he built was now referred to as the Killdozer. The Killdozer was sent out to be scrapped, and they did this by dispersing individual pieces to many separate scrapyards to prevent souvenir taking. If you're like me and you haven't heard this story before, then you'll be surprised to know that this is actually a very well-known story. Not only is there a really high production movie created that you can watch on YouTube right now since it's free, but there have been at least 5 videos on this guy that have gotten over 1 million views each. So the question that I had before writing the script, and the question that you probably have now is, Nick, why are you talking about this? I like to tell really interesting stories. Those stories usually come from locales because they are insane, but sometimes you just have to push people the wrong way for crazy stuff to start happening. Marvin's story isn't even that unknown. The trope of the city X unfairly destroying Y in order to construct Z has been around for a very long time. In Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the book because I've never seen the movie before, Arthur Dent literally wakes up to his house about to be demolished by the city in order to make room for a highway. Although Arthur did know about this plan, he had to go to the basement of his town hall building and find a dusty old blueprint. If Arthur wasn't compelled to go deep diving, he would have woken up to no home. To go even further, this introduction to Arthur is actually reflective to what's about to occur to the Earth. In the book, Aliens are about to come and destroy the Earth in order to make their own intergalactic highway. They even sent a warning message to Earth detailing their plans, but of course, since we aren't advanced enough, we never received the message. People of Earth, this is Prosthetic Vogon Jeltz of the Galactic Hyperspace Planning Council. As you are probably aware, plans for the development of the outlying regions of the galaxy involve the building of a hyperspace express route through your star system. And your planet is one of those scheduled for demolition. There's no point acting all surprised about it. The plans and demolition orders have been on display at a local planning office in Alpha Centauri for 50 of your Earth years. If you can't be bothered to take an interest in local affairs, then you don't look out. A pathetic bloody planet. I've no sympathy at all. Rise is In Hey Arnold, the first movie, Arnold must prove that the apartments he and his family live in are actually a historical location. If they aren't able to prove that, then the city will come in, destroy it, and make a mall. You know what this is? It's our future. See, here's where my new Super Beeper Emporium's gonna go up, right after we rip down the flower shop and green meats and the rest of the block. Uh, yeah, well, uh, about all that, Dad. I mean, a lot of people are gonna have to move away and sell their businesses. Yeah? What's your point? Well, I was just wondering if this whole tear down the neighborhood future tech thing is really necessary. Of course it's necessary. It's more than necessary. It's progress. You can't have progress without a little pain. No pain, no gain. But what's wrong with leaving things the way they are? I'll tell you what's wrong with it, Missy. Leave things the way they are and Big Bob's Super Beeper Emporium doesn't happen. But, Dad... Hey, 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 hey. I'm gonna say this once, and I want you to hear it, little lady. Change is good. When the new Big Bob Super Beeper Emporium goes up, the cash is gonna roll in and you'll forget all about the old neighborhood. And do you know why? Because we'll be rich. I even have a real life example of this. In Florida, in order to have the Tropicana Field built, that whole land had to be destroyed. That land, however, was occupied by a lot of black neighborhoods and businesses so they had to go. The reason I am running through these examples is that the conversation after Marvin's death would dissolve into this. Was Marvin wronged and was he justified? Defenders of Hemer will point out that Marvin killed no one in his rampage. He actually went out of his way to not kill anyone. Defenders will also point out that Marvin did really get screwed over. The petition that Marvin started 
to stop the construction of the concrete factory wasn't really going to work out and I could have told you that, but Marvin's second proposal of just building his own road, I see absolutely no problem with that. At that point, he was a very well-known welder in the community, so I believe that people would have given him a shot and at least let him try to build his own road. I don't see why he couldn't just build his own road. Other people, like the police, disagreed with this narrative. They believed that the only reason Marvin didn't kill anyone was that he got lucky. The machine he built was very unstable, and if it were to explode, it would have killed a lot of people. Marvin also did not care about the people inside the buildings he was destroying. For example, there was some kind of kid reading event at the library when he may or destroyed it. He also shot 15 bullets from his rifle at power transformers and propane tanks during his rampage. The conversation around Marvin is quite interesting, but the internet sees him more as a hero who reached a breaking point. And that right there makes an interesting story. That's what you cannot do with people in the mountains, especially in Granby. They do not know what reason is. Reason to them is doing it their way. And that's the only thing. Once they get that in their mind, that's the only thing that's reasonable. Well, I've developed that philosophy to a point, maybe even to a higher point, because I am going to be unreasonable to the extent.